When farmers produced more milk than consumers demanded in 2009, milk prices fell by 30%. The lower price made farmers less eager to produce milk and lured more consumers into buying it. These changes nudged the market toward equilibrium. Then, in 2011, with growing demand from China and elsewhere, the quantity of milk supplied fell short of the quantity demanded, and the price of milk rose to new heights. The higher price encouraged production and discouraged consumption, again leading the market toward a new equilibrium. In the milk market, as in all the markets we've discussed so far, changes in the price serve to bring supply and demand into balance. Most markets work this way, most of the time. They are either in equilibrium or heading toward equilibrium. But sometimes a market will remain out of equilibrium for a long time. The price does not adjust upward or downward as needed to bring about equilibrium. We'll discuss the reasons for this a bit later. But first, let's explore what happens if a price does not adjust to its equilibrium level. So in this module, we're going to focus on this key idea. Equilibrium prices provide benefits that are lost when forces prevent markets from reaching their equilibrium price. First, I will show how price ceilings and floors cause shortages and surpluses. Then, I will explain the important incentives prices create. And finally, I will identify problems with rationing as a way of allocating goods and services. Now, the market, or the figure rather, that you see in front of you shows the market price for milk. And what we can see here is that at a, a price below the equilibrium price right here, which would be $3 right here, you know, such as $2 if we go down here, it would create an excess demand for milk because if we go over to the demand curve, we can see that 35 gallons of milk would be demanded right here. But only 15 million gallons of milk would actually be supplied. So the existence of buyers who are willing to pay more than the current price ordinarily causes the price to rise until it reaches the equilibrium price. But what happens if for some reason the price does not rise? Then we have too much demand. The excess demand will not go away. Consumers will continue trying to buy more milk than is available. And so, when an excess demand for a product persists for a significant period of time, weeks, months, or even years, we call it a shortage. Shortages create many problems. For instance, consumers sometimes find it necessary to spend time standing in long lines at stores to increase their chances of getting the product. After the earthquake and nuclear accident in Japan in 2011, consumers in Hong Kong feared that supplies of milk from Japan would be limited or contaminated. Shoppers lined up at stores to buy milk from safe sources. Because the price of milk was below the equilibrium price, the quantity demanded exceeded the quantity supplied, and many consumers went home disappointed. Now, a shortage, therefore, will cause the price to increase, to get rid of the surplus, or the shortage, rather. The opposite situation occurs when a price stays too high. In this figure, we see that at a price of $4 per gallon, we end up with an excess supply. Why is that? Well, because 35 million gallons of milk will be supplied, 15 million gallons of milk will be demanded, and you can see those points right there. And as a result of that, we have too much. We have a surplus. Now, ordinarily, an excess supply makes the price of a good fall. But if for some reason the price does not fall, sellers will continue trying to sell more than consumers want to buy. So when an excess supply persists for a significant period of time, we call it a surplus. Sellers become frustrated with a surplus because they cannot find enough buyers. For example, there was a surplus in the U.S. housing market in 2009 and 2010. More homes were offered for sale than people wanted to buy at the prices sellers were asking. Now, although prices did fall during those years, they did not fall enough to bring supply and demand into balance. The resulting housing surplus lasted for more than two years. Moving forward, we will look at the primary causes of shortages and surpluses, and you'll learn that the government sometimes causes shortages or surpluses with policies that impose what we call price ceilings and price floors. 
You'll also see that the behavior of buyers and sellers themselves can cause shortages and surpluses. We'll use these insights to understand how prices help the economy accomplish some important goals. First, let's talk about price ceilings. A price ceiling is a government-imposed limit on the highest price firms can charge in a market. For example, New York State has a law that prevents milk prices from exceeding an amount considered to be unconscionably excessive. Sellers cannot charge a price above $4.37 a gallon. However, the equilibrium price of milk is seldom above that boundary. If they would charge, say, $4.10 in the absence of the law, the price ceiling is ineffective. It makes no difference. In contrast, a price ceiling that is set below the equilibrium price has an effect on the market because it prevents the price from reaching equilibrium. If the price ceiling for milk were $3.50, that would be an effective price ceiling because it would have the effect of forcing sellers to charge less than the equilibrium price. Several cities, including New York City, impose rent controls that prevent some landlords from charging more than a certain amount for an apartment. So if you look at this figure, it illustrates the effect of this price ceiling in the market for apartments subject to rent control. In the absence of rent control, the equilibrium would occur at point E1, right there, with the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded both equal to QE and PE. However, rent control prevents the price from reaching its equilibrium value. The price is set at P ceiling, right here, and as a result, only Q2 apartments are demanded, okay? But landlords at that lower price are only willing to provide Q1 apartments right there. And right here is what people are willing to demand. So the quantity of apartments supplied is not only smaller than the quantity demanded, Q2, but it is also smaller than QE, the quantity that would be supplied without the price ceiling. This is because the lower rent decreases the incentive to make apartments available. Because the price ceiling limits the earnings of apartment landlords, fewer new apartment buildings are built. Some existing apartment buildings are converted into hotels or office buildings, and with potential renters clamoring for the low-rent apartments, there is little incentive to keep rent-controlled apartments attractive or in good repair. So the apartment buildings tend to become run down. The most direct impact of rent control is that those people who do manage to rent apartments pay less than they would without rent control. However, for reasons we'll explore next, most economists do not believe that price ceilings such as rent control are the best way to help consumers. So a price ceiling will end up causing a shortage. Now, what are the problems with price ceilings? Well, first of all, one problem with the price ceilings is that although they are usually designed to help the poor, the beneficiaries are sometimes the rich. With the simplest form of rent control, for example, everyone pays the lower rent, including those who are very well off. Some renters may even be wealthier than the landlords who own the apartments. In these cases, a wealthier... Oops. Let me go back to the correct one. There we go. Let me get rid of that pop-up that came there. And go back to the right module. I apologize for this. There we go. Now, with the simplest form of rent control, everyone pays the lower rent, including those who are very well off. Some renters may even be wealthier than the landlords who own the apartments, as I said. In these cases, a wealthier renter benefits at the expense of a less wealthy landlord who must charge a lower rent. But another problem with price ceilings is that because they create shortages, some people who want a good at the current price cannot get it. Or they may have to waste valuable time trying to find a willing seller. And even those who do get more, who do get the good, might end up paying more than the equilibrium price. For example, with a price ceiling on milk, some people would buy a lot of milk and sell it for a price above, above the price ceiling, illegally, to people who could not find it in the stores. 
This type of illegal market is called a black market. Because milk would be so scarce, the price in the black market could be higher than the equilibrium price. The same types of problems occur with rent control. Apartment hunters have to spend more time looking for an apartment than they otherwise would. Some will have to pay real estate agents to help them find one. Others may bribe a building superintendent or a current resident to give them a heads up when an apartment is about to become available. Taking into account the opportunity cost of the extra search time and the payments to real estate agents or building superintendents, it may end up costing as much or more to rent an apartment than it would without the rent control. For all of these reasons, price ceilings are a flawed way to help consumers afford a good. Other methods that do not create shortages are considered more effective and fair. For example, instead of applying rent controls, many cities now help people with low incomes pay for apartments or homes. This allows cities to target assistance to the people who need it most. These policies also allow landlords to charge the equilibrium rent, thereby, thereby avoiding a shortage of apartments, among other problems. Now let's look at price floors. Price ceilings are intended to assist buyers of things like apartments and milk, but what about the sellers? Policies are made with them in mind, too. For example, in an effort to help dairy farmers, the U.S. government does not allow the price of non-fat dry milk to fall below 80 cents per pound. Instead, the government establishes a price floor for dry milk. A price floor is a government-imposed limit below which prices cannot fall. Now, this figure shows the effect of a price floor on the market for milk. Without the price floor in place, the equilibrium price would be PE, right here. And the equilibrium quantity would be QE. The price floor is set at P floor, right up here, which is greater than PE. This creates a surplus right here at P floor because Q2 right here which is the quantity demanded at that price is less than Q1 which is the quantity supplied at that price because the price floor is above the equilibrium price it is an effective price floor meaning it makes a difference but a price floor somewhere down here below the equilibrium price would be ineffective. It would make no difference because market forces would bring the price even higher than the ineffective price floor. That is, if the equilibrium price were 75 cents per pound of nonfat dry milk and the government said the price cannot fall below 50 cents, the price floor wouldn't make any difference because firms wouldn't charge less than 50 cents anyway. So the government, in effect, uses two methods to keep the price of milk from falling below P, the price floor. First, it provides incentives for dairy farmers to produce a smaller quantity than Q1, which is the quantity farmers would like to supply at the price of P floor. Second, when an excess supply exists at P floor, the government buys up the excess milk itself. Both of these methods are designed to avoid a surplus of milk in the market and the resulting downward pressure on the price. Price floors have been used in the United States to support the prices for milk, cheese, butter, peanuts, sugar, and many other agricultural products. They exist to make the incomes of farmers who receive the elevated prices as revenue higher than they would be without the floors. But as you might have guessed, there are some problems with price floors. Price floors are created with good intentions but they do have significant downsides. An effective price floor either creates a surplus or it necessitates government spending of tax dollars to buy up the excess supply of a good. Also, price support programs like those for agricultural products in the United States benefit all farmers who produce the supported good or the supported products even if they are wealthy and don't need help. At the same time, consumers, including many low-income families, have to pay more for products like milk, peanut butter, and sugar. Some of the farmers helped by the price floors are better off than the average consumer who buys their products. For all these reasons, 
economists generally do not favor price floors as a way to help farmers. In many markets, shortages and surpluses have nothing to do with price floors or ceilings. Instead, they're called, they're caused rather by what economists call sticky prices, which are prices that move to their equilibrium values very slowly. When prices are sticky, it can take weeks, months, or longer for a market to reach equilibrium. In the meantime, if the price is below its equilibrium value, there will be a shortage, and if the price is above its equilibrium value, there will be a surplus. Now, prices can be sticky for a number of reasons. First of all, habits, customs, and traditional arrangements with suppliers sometimes present, prevent prices from changing. For example, when demand is unexpectedly high for tickets to a new movie, theaters generally do not raise the ticket price for that movie. People who want to see the movie may not be able to get tickets for days as the result of a shortage. Why don't theaters raise the price, which would give them more profit and eliminate the shortage? The reason is partly that movie studios pressure theater owners to be consistent with ticket prices. Also, theater owners have traditionally charged the same price for every movie showing at a particular time. Breaking that custom could upset customers who might not come back to a theater that seems to charge unfair prices. Prices can also be sticky because it is costly to change them. Restaurants have to print up new menus when they raise or lower prices, and hotels have to change their advertising on billboards, in, in magazines, and on the internet. When the demand or supply curve shifts, some businesses may prefer to wait for some time before incurring the cost of changing prices. They want to be sure that the new equilibrium is going to last. Finally, sticky prices can occur because of stubbornness or due to disbelief among sellers that the equilibrium price has dropped substantially from a long-standing value. For example, the housing surplus in 2009 and 2010 arose when the equilibrium price of homes fell dramatically, but many sellers refused to lower their asking price enough to bring supply and demand back into balance. Sticky prices can delay a movement to equilibrium, but prices do not remain sticky forever. Even Motel 6, a motel chain nam named after its practice of charging $6 per room, eventually had to break with its tradition to increases in the equilibrium price. As long as prices are allowed to move up and down, sooner or later, firms tend to make adjustments toward the equilibrium price. As the housing surplus continued, for example, more and more home sellers realized they would have to accept a lower price if they wanted to sell. And as prices moved toward equilibrium, the housing surplus began to shrink. Wouldn't it be nice if the goods you like to consume were free? You might think so, but bringing the price of a good to zero can create serious problems and make everyone worse off. To see why, let's conduct a thought experiment. Suppose the government announced that from now on it would distribute clothing to households free of charge. To prevent any shortages, the government would have to either produce the clothing itself or buy it from private businesses. What would happen? First, the quantity of clothing demanded by you and everyone else would skyrocket. After all, since you don't have to pay for it, why not fill your closets to the brim? Why not turn a spare bedroom or garage into a closet and fill that too? In fact, why even do laundry? After you wear a shirt once, you could just throw it away and get a new one. Fashions would probably change quickly due to the rapid turnover of clothing. When a skirt or a pair of pants fell out of fashion, you'd replace it with the latest style. And why buy paper towels or napkins when you could just use free t-shirts to wipe up spills? In short, without a price, you and everyone else would consume, overconsume rather, clothes. Now, let's consider the supply side of the market. To avoid a shortage, production would have to increase dramatically to match the huge increase in demand. More and more resources would be shifted into the production of clothing. Land currently used to grow food crops would be used to grow cotton instead. More and more labor would be shifted to the tax, tasks of manufacturing, transporting, and distributing clothes. While we would all have plenty of clothes, they, they would come at the sacrifice of other valued goods and services. We would have less food, less entertainment, less education, less health care, and so on. If enough clothing were produced to keep up with demand at a price of zero, we would overproduce it. 
Despite the clothing being free, households would feel the effects in their pocketbooks. To fund the expanding Department of Clothing that would buy or produce and distribute free clothes, households would have to pay a larger share of their incomes and taxes. And households would have to pay higher prices for other goods and services. Why? Because with increasing amounts of resources being used for clothing, firms in other industries would have to pay more for the increasingly scarce land, labor, and capital not used to make clothing. As their costs rose, these firms would have to charge higher prices. For example, with so much farmland shifted into cotton production, there would be less farmland available for the production of wheat, and the price of farmland would rise. This would increase the cost of growing wheat, among other food crops, and cause food prices in general to rise. Due to the effects on the typical household's pocketbook, free clothes would not really be free at all. Through tax dollars and higher prices for other goods, we would still pay for our clothing indirectly. Because enormous quantities of clothes would be produced, we would pay a lot. These problems with giving things away force us to consider better ways to allocate clothing and other goods. To prevent the indirect cost of free clothes from getting out of control, the government would have to limit the supply. But when there is limited availability of a free good, shortages cause problems. For example, when a Shell gas station in Virginia offered free gasoline at a customer appreciation event in 2011, the line of cars waiting for gas was so long that several cars ran out of gas before they reached the station. And in 2008, a Walmart employee in New York was trampled to death by a crowd rushing into a store to buy goods at particularly low prices. Likewise, there would be long lines and the potential for chaos if distribution centers offered a limited quantity of free clothing on a first-come, first-served basis. To prevent problems, the government could ration clothes. To ration a good is to give a fixed quantity to each person. For example, the policy might be each year every person will get 10 pairs of pants, 15 t-shirts, 20 pairs of socks, and a winter coat. People would receive government-issued coupons for their clothing allotments, and no one would be permitted to get clothing without a coupon. With rationing, the government could reduce production while avoiding long lines and empty-handed consumers. Many countries have used rationing when distributing goods for free or when trying to cut production without letting prices rise to the new equilibrium level. For example, during World War II, the U.S. government wanted to free up resources for military production by decreasing the production of consumer goods. To deal with the resulting shortage, the government in issued coupons to ration butter, sugar, and many other basic goods. The United States also rationed gasoline during the 1970s when sudden supply suddenly decreased due to a rise in oil prices. And during the milk shortage of 2011, some stores in Hong Kong rationed dry milk. Now, rationing provides a way to allocate goods when the price is below the equilibrium price, as happens when there is a price ceiling or the price is zero. But unlike equilibrium prices that keep demand and supply in check, a policy of limiting production and relying on rationing does a poor job of accomplishing three important goals. Finding the best level of production, keeping costs low, and achieving consumer satisfaction. Production always involves trade-offs. The opportunity cost of making more of one good is that less of other goods can be made. Government officials don't have complete information on everyone's needs and desires, Therefore, they can't find the best level of production for consumers. And production decisions must be made over and over again as market conditions change. For example, if taste changed and certain clothing items became more desirable, it would be appropriate for clothing production and individual rations to rise. Or if bad weather destroyed much of the cotton crop, it would make sense to reduce production and individual rations. The government would have a hard time keeping up with complex market conditions such as these. Rationing free clothes would be costly. The government would have to set up new agencies to buy and distribute clothing and issue coupons. Consumers might try to pressure or bribe agency workers to get extra coupons. And producers might try to pressure or bribe government workers to buy their clothes at artificially high prices. To prevent corruption, the government would have to would have to catch and prosecute agency workers who broke the rules. It would also have to prevent clothing from leaking out of government warehouses into the black market, where it could be sold for a profit. All these government activities would use up resources and add to the government's cost. 
If clothing were rationed, it would be poorly allocated among households. People who really love clothes would want to consume more than their yearly allotment. Others with full closets or little interest would receive additional clothing that gave them little happiness. Getting the clothes to those who value them most would have involved added expenditures of time and money to set up online auctions, yard sales, and flea markets. There would also be problems with the clothes themselves. With limits on prices and production, firms would have little incentive or ability to produce high-quality, fashionable attire. People would have little choice but to redeem their coupons for whatever happened to be available. So what do prices accomplish? Why do they matter? Imagine that a society rations free clothing, but grows tired of the problems just discussed. The government announces a contest. A big prize will go to the designer of the best system for organizing clothing production and allocation. To win the prize, the new system must achieve the goals obstructed by rationing, while at the same time preventing shortages. As you've probably guessed from the title of this section, the prize-winning idea would be quite simple. Use prices to guide the production and allocation of clothing. Let's consider how prices would do the trick. First, prices would guide the economy to the best level of production. When a good is free, people have no incentive to be careful about how much they use. They demand too much, and if production levels are set to match the quantity demanded, too much is produced. By contrast, when people have to pay for a good, they think twice before consuming it. They limit their consumption to amounts that are, quote, worth it for them. For example, if the price of a pair of jeans is $30, you will not throw your jeans away just because they need laundering. That convenience isn't worth the price of a new pair. Positive prices help avoid wasteful overconsumption and thereby avoid wasteful overproduction. Prices serve as a signal to change consumption in the appropriate direction when market conditions change. If bad weather ruins the cotton crop, the cost of making jeans and thus the market price of jeans will increase. The consumers who place a relatively low value on jeans will respond to the higher price by decreasing their quantity demanded. Likewise, if new loom technology makes it less expensive to weave jeans, prices will fall and consumers will appropriately purchase more of the now easier to make product. Prices also serve as a direct signal to firms to change production in the right direction when market conditions change. For example, if many people suddenly want more clothing, the increase in demand will cause the market price to rise. The higher price indicates to firms that people want more clothing. To earn higher profits, firms will increase production. The next section explains more about how prices guide production to desirable levels. Prices also help to keep costs low. The influence of prices eliminates the need for a costly government rationing program. Instead, the government can play a supportive role by establishing and enforcing laws that allow buyers and sellers to trade, protecting their rights and ensuring that no one is harmed by their activities. Unless the market has special problems that require more direct government involvement, as discussed in Chapter 9, the government can stay mostly in the background and let prices do the work. Prices also help to achieve consumer satisfaction. Unlike a rationing system, a market driven by prices allows people to buy as much or as little of each good as they want at the market price. Those who are willing to pay the market price for a large quantity of clothing buy more than those who place little value on clothing. No buyer ends up with a lot of a disfavored good as they might if the good were rationed. And because production and prices are not restricted, firms will aim to make more of the goods that provide the most value to consumers relative to the cost of providing them. Prices also help to prevent shortages. As you've learned, when prices can adjust freely, they settle at their equilibrium values, where supply and demand are in balance. Every buyer, every buyer can find a seller and every seller can find a buyer. Even when a price is sticky, it tends to move to its equilibrium value over time. Equilibrium prices eliminate shortages without any need for rationing. So, how much of a good should the economy produce? And how do we know that prices will guide us to the right quantity of output? We will determine that in the next video module.